So now we're going to move into our third main section on the church planter. And uh, before getting into a lot of the descriptions of different qualities and spiritual gifts that church planters need to be effective, remember this, there are a lot of different roles on a church planting team. And I would suspect that most of you in a class like this, you'd say, you know, I would never lead a church plant. I'm not going to be a church planting pastor. And that's okay because the best way to plant churches is with a team. So you may have that leader who's the pastor or the planter or the missionary who's the primary person who's leading the, the charge. But there's going to be other team members. And so, you know, as you listen to some of these lists of qualities, you may say, well, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. And that may be the case, but that doesn't mean you can't be a team member because no one person has all the necessary gifts. But having said that, we do believe that there are any team is going to need a team leader. And because of the special challenges involved in planting a church, that team leader needs special kinds of gifts and talents. And this is something that, of course, we see the Bible talking about people with different spiritual gifts. And not everybody has all the spiritual gifts. There were some like Apollos. He was a water. He was not really a planter. Paul, uh, Paul was a planter, a pioneer. And it would have been a mistake to try and take an Apollos and have him to try and do the ministry that Paul was doing. And Paul would have been frustrated if he was held back spending all his time trying just to work with churches that had problems. There was something in him that kept pushing him forward, outward to new places. And that's the way God made him. That's the way God made Apollos. They were different in their gifts and in their ministries. And so one of the really important things to do as you begin to think about planting a new church, whether that's a, a daughter church that goes out from an existing church or whether it's a pioneer church plan in a whole new place starting from zero. The leader of that team needs particular gifts and qualities. And that has been the topic of research from a number of different groups, trying to discern how can we identify those people who are best suited for church planting. And this is not trying to second guess the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's trying to identify how the Holy Spirit has already gifted a person for certain types of ministry. And so what I'm going to be discussing is the results of some of the findings of research uh, that has been done to determine what are the characteristics of effective church planters. Well, one of the most widely used uh, studies and approaches is that of Charles Ridley. And Charles Ridley was a professor, I believe, of business and management. He was not a church planter himself. But he did considerable research into the kinds of things that church planters had to do to get the job of church planting done. And he came up with a list of qualities that have been used now by many, many different organizations and denominations to discern if a person has the abilities and the gifting that is needed. And I want to go through that list with you uh, one by one and just sort of describe these. Now, the first one to mention is what's called visioning capacity. Now, what does that mean? That means it has to be a person who not only has a vision, but they can communicate that vision. The ability to see a future that's not there yet. You see, if you're a pastor of an existing church or you're leading an existing organization, um, it's not too hard to envision how that can continue to develop. But you see, if you're a church planter, you've got to look and see a church that's not there yet. You've got to be able to imagine people coming to know Christ who who you, don't, you haven't met yet. So you have to not only have a vision for reaching these new people, creating this new church, but you also have to have the ability to communicate that to others. Because as I mentioned, most good church planters gather a team of other people around them that are able to come alongside and to help launch that effectively. 
Apostle Paul had his team, whether it was a Timothy and a Silas or a Barnabas, when he planted churches. So you persuasively communicate that vision to others, and others sense this is of God. I want to also pursue that vision. And that vision is then going to become a, a driver because there's going to be many setbacks. There's going to be discouragement along the way. I've never met a church planner who said everything was just a straight up ride, that everything went right. <laughs> there's going to be spiritual opposition, we said. That vision, the sense that this is something that God has called, and this is what God has laid in my heart, that will keep one going. So we believe that God can create something out of nothing. It's very similar to a gift of faith. Being intrinsically motivated, what does this mean? Well, there's a saying in German, you shouldn't have to drag the hound to the hunt. A hunting dog ought to be pulling at the leash to go hunting, to get the rabbit. I mentioned my dog Hunter. I'll have to bring him into the story right here. My dog Hunter, when there's a rabbit in our backyard, I don't have to tell him, get the rabbit, chase the rabbit. It's in his blood. He sees the rabbit. He's after the rabbit. Now, a church planter needs to be that kind of person who from their very inner being is motivated to go out and do this. They get up in the morning and, well, maybe they still have to set the alarm, but they get up in the morning and they know today I'm going to love what I do. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do what it takes. Um, it's not the kind of person that has to have somebody constantly following up. Did you go and do what you need to do today? Uh, did you meet some new people today? Uh, how's that plan working out? A good church planter is going to be very self-motivated because he's usually not going to have somebody that's looking down and he's have a boss. See, when you're in a normal church ministry, I've got a church that I'm responsible to. I know I have to preach. I know I have to do certain responsibilities of counseling or um, leading meetings or, or all the different things that pastors do. My job is fairly well laid out for me. Well, when you're a church planter, when you show up, there's no church. <laughs> there's no place to preach every Sunday. There's nobody to teach. There's no one to counsel. There's no meetings to lead. You're it. And so you've got to be the kind of person who creates those moments that, that keeps self-disciplined. And I know that some church planters who are not self-motivated, they get distracted with a lot of different things. And then they become not effective. We call that being a self-starter and being willing to build something from nothing. Creating ownership of ministry. Now, this is kind of an interesting point that as people begin to come, become a part of this church or as you have your team members, you're able to give them the sense that this is not just my personal project. This is not just something that Craig Ott wants to do. But this is something God wants you involved in. And so you're not just following what I'm saying the right thing to do is. You have a sense of ownership. I'm a part of this movement. I have an investment in this. I'm going to invest myself in this. And so the church planner can bring people in and give them that sense that this is not just his vision, but it's something they can be involved with. And you create a sense of congregational identity by doing that. And it also instills commitment. This is so important because initially the church plant is started by somebody usually who comes from the outside. It's somebody who was sent there to plant this church. But if that church is going to thrive and not just survive, the local people that are coming into that church have to sense this is our project. This isn't somebody, something that somebody on the other side of town thought up. We are the people of God here. One of the things I used to like to do when we would start a church plant we might have just 10 people that were starting out in the church. And we'd go and we'd have a retreat. We'd 
we'd go and get away for a weekend. And um, we'd go around and share the stories of how God had led each person to be a part of this group. And collectively, we began to sense this is no accident. This is not just something that somebody had on a, a plan somewhere. God is business. God is bringing these people together. A sense of ownership. And then later, as commitments are demanded, we need to have money to be able to do this project or do evangelism or rent a building or whatever. The people sense this is, this is what God's called us to. We're going to give sacrificially because they see that this is God's calling for them. Now, relating to the unchurched, the unchurched, of course, would be those people who don't attend church. They, 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 can't, they can't relate maybe to Christians or Christianity, and uh, maybe they've never been to church, or if they do go to church, it's once a year or something like that. And so the church planter does not necessarily have to be a strong evangelist. You know, the gift of evangelism is that person who just really can share their faith well and other people respond to the gospel. Now, the church planter doesn't have to be that kind of person. Maybe there's, in fact, it's very important if there can be other people on the team who have that kind of gift of evangelism. But the church planter does have to have a passion for evangelism, a heart for evangelism, and the church planter has to be able to build relationships with the people in the community. Now, sometimes people who are in ministry, they've grown up in a Christian home, they attended church all their life, all their friends all their life have always been Christians. And quite honestly, they have difficult relating, difficulty relating to people who are not Christians. And, you know, they may go to their workplace, but then they always retreat with their Christian friends. And people in vocational ministry are with Christians all the time. Now, the church planter has to be the kind of person who can go out and relate to non-Christians to be able to build those kind of relationships. He can kind of begin to think the way the non-Christian is thinking. So, you know, even if he's not that evangelist who, who helps people come to Christ, the way he teaches, the way he relates to them is a way that they can identify with. This person understands us. This person speaks the kind of language we understand. You know, we sometimes talk about the language of Canaan that gets spoken inside of churches. You know, it's sort of that spiritual language that only Christians understand. You know, non-Christians says, what are they talking about there? What, you know, what, what are all these terms? Uh, we have certain ways of phrasing things that an ordinary person would never do. See, the church plan has to be that kind of person who can, can build relationships, can speak the language of the local people, and... Uh, develop those kind of relationships and break the barriers. Especially if you're working in an area where there's very, very few Christians or only just very nominal Christians. You've probably heard this. Oh, the church, that's, uh, that's just a big hierarchical cold institution and the people are corrupt and uh, they've got a lot of money and you know all the Christians are hypocrites. People have all these problems with the church. Are you the kind of person that can relate to people in a way that helps them overcome some of those issues. Um, or if you're in a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu area, where people say, oh, Christianity, that's just a Western religion, that doesn't relate to us. Are you the kind of person that can help relate that message to their questions in a way that makes sense to them? So relating to the unchurched, that ability to develop Rapport. Spousal cooperation. Now, by this we mean it's usually, in most cases, the church planter is a man, but it might be a woman as well. We're not just talking about, say, the wife saying to their husband, if you want to do that, I approve. <laughs> cooperation for a church planter has to be where the spouse says, I'm in, I'm committed. I'm willing to make the sacrifices because there will be sacrifices in a church plant. All kinds of sacrifices. 
There may not be a, a, a nice program for the children. It's a small group. There aren't many children. There may not be a youth group for, for, for young people because there's not very many people there. There's not all the programs a normal church would have. Your income may be irregular. If you're a pastor in an established church, well, then there's, there's giving. There's a certain level of security and comfort there. You go into a church plant, you may have days where you don't have a lot of reliable income. You don't know what the future is going to be. Now, for some people, that drives them crazy. Uh, they're not up for that. And, and that's okay. Not everybody is made for that kind of a life. But both the husband and the wife, if you're going to go into church planting, have to have that kind of mindset that say, this is going to be a work of faith. It's going to be costly. We have sacrifices. And there's no guarantees. And both have to really look that hard and say, are we in for that? Because if you have only one person doing it, then the other one is eventually going to become unhappy. And uh, unhappy wife means unhappy husband. And uh, unhappy husband means unhappy wife. So if you don't have a strong marriage and you have a common vision, then the work is going to suffer. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. Uh, you know, one thing, just as an example here, is typically in church planting, you have to exercise a lot of hospitality because you may not have a church building. You probably don't in the beginning, for sure. You don't have meeting places. And a lot of the work you're doing is relationships. And so you're going to be having people in your home all the time. You may be having Bible study groups or evangelistic discussion groups in your home. And so again, here the spouse has to be willing to open up their home. For many people to say the home is a private place, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing that or I don't like all the extra work of having to cook or clean up or whatever to have people in our home. It's just another example of how everybody's got to be on board. Effectively building relationships. And I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we spoke about building relationships with unbelievers, with non-Christians. And of course, it has to be the same way for building relationships with believers or anybody. Are you a relational sort of person? Some pastors are really teachers, and they're good teachers. They're maybe good theologians, and maybe they're good managers and just keeping the church organization going and having the programs and all that sort of thing, but they're not as highly relational. Well, a church planter has to be even more relational than most pastors because, again, so much of the work is building trust sharing the gospel, making people feel that this is a place where they can have a spiritual home, it has to be highly relational. And I can tell a negative story here. Um, the, the church plant, in fact, it was the first church I was involved planting in the United States, where uh, we were involved in, uh, for two years in getting a church plant going. And uh, by the way, I, I was what we call a tent maker. I had a secular job. I was working and we started, I was working 40 hours a week at a secular job at a steel company. And then as the church began to grow, I cut back and I worked half time at the steel company and half time for the church. And then the church was able to pay me. So I know what it means later when we talk about, you know, being a tent maker and a bivocational church plant. I know what that means. I've done that myself. But we worked in this church plant for a couple of years. It grew, it did well. And then the time came where we were going to leave. We became missionaries to Germany. We planted churches in Germany. And when we left that church, the church, it took them a while to find and to call a pastor who would come and carry that church forward. And although the development had been very positive to that time, they ended up calling a person who was not very relational. And um, so when new people would come, he was not the kind of person that could make those people feel welcome. He was not a people person that enjoyed just talking and being around people. Uh, you know, he would sort of do his ministry, preach, and then, you know, kind of go home. And um, 
basically that church plant began to go down and down. Uh, it didn't end up thriving. And every pastor should be a people person, but especially church planters have to be highly relational and um, identifying needs and relating to people in those needs. Committed to church growth. Now, this is important because sometimes um, people, uh, a pastor may have the idea, well, I'll plant that church, and as soon as a church kind of gets to a level where things are stable, they kind of shift from evangelism and discipleship to counseling and teaching and just sort of uh, status quo. Well, we're paying the bills, we've got some programs, um, and that, you know, that, that's kind of good enough. We would like to grow, but that's, their emphasis shifts. Now, if that church planner is not committed to the church growing and continuing to meet new people, it's probably going to stay very small. And it may not end up being a very strong church plant. And so commitment to church growth is important, not just numerical growth, but also the spiritual growth of the people. It's important for that church to become financially self-supporting if it wasn't from the beginning. So that's a sign of commitment. It's a sign that people really are committed to this church. They own it. They're willing to make sacrifices for it. And so growth in all these different areas is going to be important for the longer term health of the church. Responsiveness to the community. Now this is important to identify needs of a community because one of the best ways to build relationships, to build the trust, to demonstrate the love of Christ is to identify needs in the community. And we'll talk about some of this more later, but can you identify a need? Maybe, maybe there's some children who are, are migrant children and they need tutoring. They don't know the local language very well. Uh, maybe there's another need of single mothers uh, who are wrestling with the challenges of being a single mother. What are the needs of the community and can you connect with those needs? Um, how does the church respond to some of those community needs and adapt? And that church that can adapt and relate to the community needs, that's a church that's going to connect with the people. That's a church that can really make the love of Christ visible. And people who maybe didn't want to have anything to do with Christians begin to go, hmm, maybe, maybe there's something to Christianity. Maybe, maybe a relationship with these people would be something good. And so ability to relate to the community and respond to the community is important. Utilizing the gifts of others. Now this is something we've already touched upon, how the Apostle Paul mobilized others. But being able to identify how people have spiritual gifts and then get them going, get them plugged into ministries where they can use that gift. Um, that is so key because you can't do everything yourself. Some of us tend to be just the people who we want to do everything. We're so motivated and we're not patient enough to train somebody else to do something. And being patient, mobilizing others, connecting their spiritual gifts with opportunities to serve is a real key. We did uh, an assessment of a potential church planter one time. I'll talk about church planning assessment uh, in, in our next session. But... Uh, this, this man looked like he'd be a great church planner. He, he'd been a foreign missionary. He'd, he'd started things before. He was evangelistic. He had many of the features we were looking for, but this thing he did not have. He never really had empowered other people to do ministry. He'd never really helped people flourish and delegate uh, responsibilities to other people. He, he was a guy that did everything himself. And that may work at the very beginning, but you can't really grow a church that way. So a church planner has to be not just a doer, but also a mobilizer of others. Flexible and adaptable almost goes without saying, because there's so many unexpected circumstances that are going to come up. If you're the kind of rigid person as I've got my plan, it's got to happen this way, Monday I'm going to do this, Tuesday I'm going to do that, church planning is not for you, <laughs> because there are just too many unpredictable factors um, that, that you just don't know what's going to happen. And so learning to flex, adapt, you discover a new need you didn't think was there. Well, we're going to shift our ministry to reach that need. We thought we were going to do this, but now we see an open door over here. We're going to do that. That's the way a church planter has to be wired. Building group cohesiveness, we've already mentioned this, that people have that sense of being the body of Christ, 
not just people who come to a meeting on a Sunday. See, some churches are kind of like that. People just kind of come to a meeting, they listen to somebody preach, they sing some songs, they go home. And that's not really a body of Christ. Church planner has to be able to create that because most of these people may have never been in a church before. If you're reaching new people for Christ, they don't know what the church is. You've got to create that sense of community and one anotherness, cohesiveness. And then resilience. We're almost done with this list here. Resilience. In other words, when the setbacks come, when the discouragement sets in, when you have that Sunday morning service and only 10 people show up, you don't give up. You have a strong sense this is what God's calling is. We're in the right place and we are going to, to do whatever it takes. We're not going to give up easily. And then exercising faith. As we mentioned, you've got to be able to believe that God is going to create something out of nothing. You've got to have that expectation that's contagious. If you're the kind of person who goes into this saying, well, I don't know if this is really going to work or not, <laughs> how many people are going to follow you? You're going to give up pretty quick and say, oh, I guess, I guess it didn't work after all. You've got to be that kind of person who says, you know, I'm going to trust God for this. I believe God can do this. And I believe in a way that other people are going to also believe. And so it's a deep conviction of God's guidance. You've got to have that conviction. This is really what God wants. Now, this is Charles Ridley's list. We'll look at another list after we take a break. <laughs>